Today is Thursday, April 3rd, 2008. I am H.F. Williamson. I am interviewing O.B. Streeper for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center. We are at Studio X, Campbell Hall in Urbana, Illinois. Henry Radcliffe is the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. I'd like you to start by telling us what you were doing as the war began and then how you came to join the armed services. Well, <clears throat> at the time the war began, I was um, uh, working at uh, Eureka Williams, uh, which was Williams Automatic at the time as a machinist. And uh, <clears throat> then I come up for draft and um, when they asked me uh, what my occupation was, I didn't tell them I was a machinist. Kind of I had, if I wouldn't have got in. And I went into service and uh, I wandered into Rangers. Uh, when I finally got down to Florida, they said, no, you're going to be on an air crew. I said, I don't want to be on an air crew. Well, you're on it anyway. And uh, at that time, they were getting ready to build a big push for the Air Force to start to destroy Europe. This was 1940, early 1940? 1943. Okay. And uh, so uh, they decided that I would go to armament school and uh, learn to take care of all the guns on the aircraft, the turrets and stuff, and to gunnery school to be an aerial gunner on B-24. <clears throat> and I flew the ball turret, which hung underneath, and it was a very interesting place to be for hours on end. And uh, I had two 50 caliber machine guns up beside my head, about six inches. That's the reason I have a little difficulty uh, hearing you people now. <laughs> but uh, we went through, uh, well, they formed as a complete group and was formed up in Mountain Home, Idaho, and then went down to um, uh, Fresno, California, finished phase two, phase three, and shipped out for North Africa, stayed there a little while, and then moved right up into Italy. Italy just, part of Italy had just fallen, Rome had just fallen. <clears throat> and um, then we started uh, operations out of there as a flight crew. So had you flown bombing missions while you were in Africa? No, no, just a lot of practice, just a lot of practice. And your whole crew had begun, you first got together in Idaho and then stayed together all the way till All Africa? the way through. We had our own airplane. Nobody got in that airplane, only us. And, uh, you know, you see them now, they, different crews fly different airplanes, no? We had an airplane issued to us in California just before, at Fresno, just before we got ready to leave. And that was our airplane and uh, we put our own names on it. And uh, our aircraft uh, had a couple names, you know, everybody wanted a name. But uh, the basic name, it was miscarriage. <laughs> And uh, everything had a sting of humor to it. Everything did. And I won't even name some of the names some of the aircraft <laughs> was named. Uh, that would censor the whole unit. <clears throat> but uh, you were living a different life. You were living a life of uh, uh, what you wanted to. Uh, our first mission we went on was up to Bihak, Yugoslavia. And uh, we were to bomb a marshalling yard. We were dropping 20-pound um, frags. Each aircraft would uh, drop uh, 40 clusters, six bombs to a cluster. And um, as we was coming off the target, you know, everybody was wanting to see what it looked like to hit the bombs, and two of them went together like that, and then they rolled a couple times and split in half. So our very first mission, which was a milk run, we lost two B-24s and 20 men. And from then on, it just kept every day, every day, one day after another. Then we'd get in replacements, and, <clears throat> and uh, uh, that went right up to it. Was, uh, now, when you were back on the base. What, sir? When you were back on the base between missions, were you living as a crew in the same hut? Or how? what was the condition there? Well, we had a uh, pyramidal tent, you know, one of those square tents. And um, six enlisted men lived in that. And then down a little ways was officers' tents. But nobody paid any attention. The officers were down at our place. We was up to theirs. And we had a social club. 
And uh, the social club is not like they show on television, everybody together beating one another in the back and laughing and going on. You'd have 10 men here, 10 men here, 10 men here, and as you'd come in, you'd go like that and go sit down at your table, and you guys would have a moderately drink. You didn't drink heavy. You did not drink heavy because your life depended on the next day or the next day after that. <clears throat> so you'd sit there, and uh, you didn't want to know the other crew because they aren't going to be there tomorrow. What do you mean they ain't going to be there tomorrow? Just probably they ain't going to be there, but we're going to be here. So that was the philosophy used to keep your mind straight. They're going to lose them, but we're not. We're going to make it. And uh, we would get briefed. And um, these were these were daylight missions. Yes, all daylight. And we would get briefed on the target, and enlisted men and officers all together at the same time. And uh, what you was going to expect in line of flak, what you was expecting in uh, fighter uh, uh, attack, and what <coughs> um, type of uh, cover were you going to have by our fighters. The only thing we had was P-47s and P-38s. P-51s was practically non-existent at the time we were flying. And the 47s would lay up there about 40,000 feet. And the fighter, they had come down on top of the fighters, and it was a hell of a fight. And uh, the, it didn't work quite like they liked to make it out. As you were going in, the fighters, you might see anywhere from 10 to 50 of them out there. Oh, you'd see a lot more around different spots in the sky because the sky was completely full of aircraft, but they weren't bothering you. They were looking for the first straggler, the first one that started trailing smoke, first one that was starting to fall back. As soon as he fell out, man, they'd wham, they'd have him. They'd come in in groups of five like that. You'd go down, you'd go down. And maybe they'd get people out of the aircraft, maybe they wouldn't. It was really hard to say. And then, <clears throat> but as long as you stayed in tight formation, fighters didn't like to fool with you because there was too many 50 caliber machine guns going to fire on them. You never knew who shot down what aircraft. When you figure there's five aircraft and each gun, each aircraft's got <coughs> eight to ten guns firing, now who done the shooting? <laughs> so uh, that can get to be a good war story if you want to push it. And uh, <coughs> then you would hit the um, target and uh, you would go in. We'd generally go in around from uh, 19,000 to 21,000 feet. And um, the nose gunner, he would holler, Bombay doors open. He would be watching the next group and the next group ahead, and he'd see them, Bombay doors come up, <coughs> Bombay doors open. So the bombardier, he'd open our bomb bay doors. And he had how many feet he was going to drop each bomb apart and stuff like that, but he didn't use the site. We had Norton bomb sites. He never used a Norton bomb site. We bombed off of the lead aircrafts. And uh, pretty soon they say bombs away, and he goes, there they go. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> sometimes you hit the target, sometimes you miss the target. But every time we missed the target, I figured we made some Christians down there anyway. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> then we'd turn and make a sharp turn and try to lose altitude very rapidly to get out of the flak area. Kind of when you was going in on target, the only thing you could do was head in on a straight IP, you were at one certain altitude, one certain speed, and that was it. So the flak would be tremendous. And uh, as soon as you dropped, then did an evasive action, make a turn, get down. And when you come out of the flak and the fighters would be out there looking at you, first one they seen trailing fire or smoke or feathered engine, they'd go in after him. And um, I can well assure you they'd pretty well get them. <clears throat> and sometimes going in on a mission, you'd develop engine trouble going in, and you'd have to abort the mission and head home. Well, we had the best luck getting down as low as you could get to the ground. Uh, I've got some pictures in my album of being of 25 to 30 feet off the ground, and uh, so the fighters couldn't get under you. They couldn't come down on you. The only thing they come in is straight in from the rear or straight in from the front. And that was pretty suicide because you had two fifties out of the back 
uh, 250s on top, and then the two waist guns could get into them. Hmm. And, uh, but if you uh, screwed around out there much, stayed up high, they'd get you. And the fighters would come in, they'd try to help us as much as they could, and then they'd have to break and head home. And uh, it... Um, so you're saying the, the United States fighter cover couldn't cover you the entire mission because they had no. the fuel problem? No. In the briefing, they'd say, uh, you'll have uh, 25 uh, P-47s high, and you'll have another uh, 30 uh, P-38s to cover two to three groups. And uh, they'll be coming in the same altitude as you are. And uh, then, uh, um, boy, there were some dogs out there, I'm going to tell you. I've seen where one P-51 tackled three fighters. <coughs> and uh, because two aircraft was heading home, shot up. And... Uh, they, they were fantastic. They yeah. were fantastic. And uh, so, roughly, how often were the missions daily? Every other day, or how many? Uh, we week? generally fly um, two days and then be off a day, and then fly two days, and then you might uh, <clears throat> have to abort your mission because of bad weather, and you would have uh, your um, primary target. Then you'd have a secondary target. If you couldn't get in on your primary target because of weather, then you'd hit the primary, uh, the secondary target. And then after that, you could go for a target of opportunity. You know, churches, schools, anything to get credit for a bombing mission. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that because we'd pop uh, something that looked like it would be an enemy uh, installation of some kind. <laughs> now, I think you said there are 25, you had to, if you completed 25 missions, you were... Completed one tour, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. How does it, you want to explain how that worked? Um, well, life expectancy of a flight crew is 16 missions. And uh, as I've said before, and you didn't dwell on it, uh, the chances of getting anybody out of an airplane was very, very, very slim. Very slim. Most generally, they just blow up. And uh, <laughs> you... Uh, um, if you completed 25 missions, then were you sent back to the States, or how did Then you'd work? come back to the States. Uh, we got the 23 missions. We got shot down on our 23rd mission. So we went clear by the 16, and we were feeling real good, kind of two more missions, and we got her made. And it uh, didn't work out quite that way. Well, why don't you talk, uh, are you ready to talk about that 23rd mission? Would that well, be appropriate? <clears throat> That uh, the mission we went down on was um, to be a pretty good mission. We was going to be bombing up near uh, Nice, France. We was going into a Ju-88 air drone up there. They were giving the shipping a lot of trouble with Ju-88s, <coughs> and uh, we'd been up there a couple of days earlier, and flak wasn't bad. Nothing was too bad. So we thought, boy, we got another good one coming this time. Well, nose gunner. <coughs> spotted flak, and he said, looks like there's about six, maybe eight guns. Next thing, that air blast started shaking and shimmy, and then fire flew out to, off to one wing. What we found out later, they did, from the last time was up there, they put in um, uh, radar controlled guns. And uh, the uh, uh, number four engine caught fire. It uh, blew the tip of the wing off. And there was a 75-gallon fuel tank in the end of the wing. So it was strolling gas back, and it hit the tail. And we actually lost one complete tail off of B-24. And uh, there was no question. Later up there and was headed out. And I was hoping to God we'd get over land. See, we was over water. <clears throat> and I was hoping we'd get over land. I just had no desire to jump into that water. And uh, we was fortunate. Um, we got out, and it was very rare that you ever got 10 men out of an aircraft, very rare. I'd been hit in the hip and the side of the lake down in here, and uh, I didn't know how bad it was. All I know that uh, my clothes was bloody. And uh, so we started jumping over land, and I seen uh, uh, Zinner, he lit right on a road, and the Germans had a convoy coming up. They just stopped, picked old Zinner up, and put him in a truck. And uh, now, what? This was daylight, huh? Was this? This was during the day. 
What time of day was this that your your plane went down? What kind of what? What time of day? Uh, it was a nice day. It was a good day, sunshiny day. Um, nothing specially out was of it. Was it the afternoon? Uh, went on at 10, 10 in the morning. Okay. And so they uh, had no trouble. If there were Germans, they had no trouble seeing your. Parachute. Oh no, they had no trouble seeing us. And another one, he broke both legs, and he laid up there for two days before they found him. <clears throat> And um, I figured I was going to ride down into them, and uh, I caught an updraft. <clears throat> my parachute caught an updraft, and it kind of raised me like that and dropped me down on the other side of a mountain. I was coming right down there at the top of the mountain, and I got an air draft of some kind and dropped me on the other side. That's the only reason I got away. And uh, <clears throat> when I uh, hit the ground, I lit on some big rocks, and it um, drugged me. <clears throat> And I had a little trouble getting out of the chute. Stun you pretty good, I can tell you that. And uh, while I was hanging up there, I kept looking at my leg, and I could see blood coming over my boot. And, you know, I could imagine uh, hysterically that I'd lost part of my leg or something. Well, I didn't. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so uh, I got down there, and I took a shot of morphine and put a couple of Carlisle bandages on my leg. and. It wasn't really that bad, but I, in my hip, there was a piece of steel about like that in my hip, and I could feel it. So you look, and when you go down, you have so little things in life. I have a 45 automatic. I got the big first aid kit. It's, I got the escape kit with the silk maps that you've seen in my folder. And I uh, got a big knife, leather jacket, and that's it. So you start looking around and, well, what kind of salvage? <clears throat> and I cut some nylon out of my parachute to make kind of a cover to cover up with and some shroud line. And uh, took, uh, I'd taken my morphine and I started out and then I had to take more for me morphine. I had about 15 charrettes of morphine and I took them all within uh, three days. <clears throat> and uh, I was going into a little village of uh, La Sassa and give myself up. I was still in uniform. I had done no uh, acts of violence or anything like that. I was carrying a gun. <clears throat> and uh, I was spooky as a $3 bill. And some old gal with a little kid grabbed me and pushed me back into the undergrowth. And I thought, what in the hell is that? And I laid there, and I don't know, 5, 10, 15 minutes, and pretty soon a German convoy, a uh, German uh, patrol goes by. And uh, <clears throat> holy God. So I'm still laying there, and then two of the most beautiful French girls come out, and got me, got me up, got my arms around them. <clears throat> of course, I seen them 48 years later, and they weren't that beautiful then. But anyway, <laughs> at that time, I thought they was beautiful. And they took me up <clears throat> into uh, uh, La Sassa. And um, uh, Pommier, uh, he was an underground agent. Well, they tried to speak English and, you know, hello. Well, you speak uh, English, hello. <laughs> it's a little trying. And when you're spooked up, when you're spooked on top of it, and scared to death. <clears throat> so then they moved me down a few miles to uh, La Mouse. And La Mouse, Edward uh, Pomelong, and he was a big wheel with the underground, the, um, the Maquis. There was the Maquis, and there was the FFI, French Forces of Interior. And then there was a lot of splinter groups in there, a lot of splinter groups. You had to watch your P's and Q's real good. Anyway, uh, they laid me on a table with no anesthetic, cut the flak out of my hip, and sutured me up with dirty fishing string. Now, if you don't think that <laughs> uh, <laughs> didn't make an ordeal, well... <clears throat> Then, and I have pictures of him, <clears throat> they took me out to the edge of town about where she'd shoved me, and sometime later in the evening, <clears throat> time is, you cannot tie anything to time when you're doped up. <clears throat> a motorcycle with a sidecar pulled up, and a machine gun was flopping around on the sidecar. So I pulled down on him, I was going to shoot him, and somebody said, no, no, and it was uh, Edward. And this Frenchman had stole a German motorcycle. And they got me up and they put me in the motorcycle. And uh, 
got me probably 20, maybe 25 miles out of this area and hid me out in a, in a place. <clears throat> and uh, from then on, that's just, just the way she kept afloating. And you had to, to believe in certain people. And certain people you could not trust. You could not trust them. If I might ask you, before you start talking further about the work, what happened to the remainder of your crew? Did you find out later? <coughs> yeah. Um, uh, one was taken PW immediately, the other broke both legs, and then uh, <coughs> they got picked up um, shortly thereafter. And uh, Benny Nord, <coughs> he's out of Union City, Tennessee. Uh, I was with him um, two and a half months later. And we traveled some together, and Harold Steele. <clears throat> and uh, I said, uh, we was up in a little further north in France, and I said, uh, uh, let's get out of here, Ben. I said, it ain't right. He said, we'll leave tomorrow. I said, no, I'm leaving now. I said, it ain't right. There's something wrong. And I said, uh, you know where I'm probably going to be. <laughs> well, Benny stayed. About four hours after I did, the Germans raided the place. They would have killed me, <clears throat> probably, because I didn't have any dog tags. I hated dog tags. I wouldn't wear dog tags. I've been bullheaded all my life, and why change now? <laughs> and anyway, <clears throat> uh, I worked my way back down into southern France, and uh, they had a lot of ways. The French are very colorful, you know. And uh, Edward, he had quite a knit organization. I helped them blow up some bridges, some stuff, and <clears throat> since it's all over, you have to look back and laugh that <clears throat> we um, picked up a bunch of British plastic. They dropped it to us on a drop area, and we loaded it in a truck and then hid the truck out the following day, and then the next <clears throat> evening we went down to blow a bridge. And um, what reason we was blowing a bridge, I don't know. The French decided we're going to blow the bridge up. Well, Harold Steele met with me, and uh, there were six guards there, and he, Steele took three, I took three, and wham, 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 and it's all over with. Well, they wanted to know if we knew anything about explosives. Now, have you ever seen an American didn't know everything about anything? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know all about it. <laughs> First time we set an explosion on there, it was one of these big stone bridges, you know, like this. Had to be 100 feet above the water. Blew a hole about big enough to where I'm sitting here. So we took the rest of the explosive, probably a ton and a half or so, put it in the hole, backed the truck up on it, and uh, <clears throat> I was um, going to leave and go across the uh, bridge, pick up my Alpine bag, and disappear. Well, the French heard the Germans coming, and it blew the bridge. My pack is on the other side. I was in civilian clothes. Uh, in my pack, they had um, looted the Germans. There was, I understand, I never seen it, I understand, from extra good sources. There was um, billfolds, wristwatches, everything off the six Germans. Souvenir Joe. <clears throat> well, then they wanted me real bad. Also, I had a C uh, three Argus. That's what I took all these pictures with, even with some of the French. Well, thank God the film was in my pocket of the French underground, you know, I had the pictures of. <clears throat> so um, things got very, very desperate after that. They wanted me, me bad. I'm, I'm afraid I got you ahead of yourself, but when you were, you, the bag that was across the river was discovered by the Germans then? Because? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But they didn't have any of the film, just the camera itself. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, I, can I take you back to a few days after you had landed and had that horrible surgery? You then joined this unit? Yes, I joined up, <clears throat> and I'd be with Pummy, and I had several hiding places. I had uh, several hiding places. I had some people that was, uh, I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for part of the French people. They risked their lives, they risked the lives of their family to uh, keep me, give me food. Uh, they had no food, but what little they had, they would give me. And um, um, it was unbelievable. <clears throat> and then you had uh, moving around the country. It was um, mind-boggling. 
you had a courier, and maybe the courier would start out as a <clears throat> alpine bag, and they would tell you, you follow the alpine bag. Don't get close to it. Stay back just where you can see it. If they put the alpine bag down, you sit back way away from it. <coughs> when somebody else picks the bag up, <coughs> follow the bag. And uh, I had uh, <coughs> followed the bag a long, long, long way. You were telling me some of these carriers were relatively young people. Yes. Uh, <coughs> there was one young girl. She was, um, oh, I don't know, I would about that big, you know, and you'd say, my God, I wouldn't even let her do the dishes. Boy, she knew the country. <coughs> and uh, I would follow her, and she took me down to another group, and then they'd get another courier, and maybe it'd be a young girl, maybe it'd be a, an older person, and uh, you'd just keep it going. And then they had uh, different insignias, if you would leave you somewhere. <coughs> and I wore a pair of um, gray knickerbockers, a pair of um, um, hobnail boots, a uh, black sh uh, wool shirt, and a spoot coat like this, only it was blue. Well, <coughs> I don't know if I can do it correctly anymore, but the idea was you would kind of go like that. And you would stand there like this. That was the insignia that you were the man that is in the courier in to pick up. So they would come by and bump you and you would follow them. And uh, sometimes it was mind boggling the things that all <laughs> went on. And uh, it was well organized. Uh, we had radio contact and um, I think they were in radio contact with Algiers. We would string wire antennas up into trees and some of the French should de -de -de deep, 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 and, and uh, <clears throat> uh, there was a lot of attempts to get me out of it, a lot of attempts. On one of them, they come up with a hair scheme idea that there's a submarine going to come into the bay. <clears throat> and the submarine had picked me up. Well, I wasn't really not overly enthusiastic about getting on a submarine. I said, I got out of one airplane, <clears throat> but now I'm going to get in a submarine, which you're never going to come up on. <laughs> Anyway, they put me in a little wood boat and they had a bunch of fishing nets. So they had me get underneath the fishing nets, they covered me all up. And they were rowing around out there in the bay <coughs> looking for this submarine. And there's German patrol boats shining spotlights all over. Now if you ever laid underneath a bunch of old rotten fish nets, it ain't the most nice thing you've ever done. But thank God the Lord was willing, they no submarine showed up. <laughs> But there was a lot of stuff like that that went on. Well, did, did the American people know what happened to you? No, all they know is missing in action. <coughs> and So your family didn't know No, nothing. They, my, uh, my wife uh, got a telegram to regret to inform you that Staff Sergeant Owen Streeper is uh, missing in action from uh, uh, enemy fire. That was it. And a letter will follow. They never did get another letter. <coughs> and um, uh, the place I stayed a lot, uh, I've got a picture of the house. And I stayed, oh, I would say a mile, mile and a half out there in a little old stone house. That was one of my safe places I could come back to. <coughs> and um, they would... Um, hang linen out the windows, laundry. If, if uh, laundry was hanging out of those windows, get out of here quick, as the French would say, part there too, sweet out among. So you'd shift gears and get out of there. And it was all heavy undergrowth, so I could disappear. Um, I got on a train. I don't speak French. I had um, papers, and uh, I was supposed to have been a Swiss, uh, and uh, I had TB. And uh, they'd photograph me, they'd put her in there, <coughs> and um, um, went to get on the train, and they told me that this person would get me a ticket, and you do what they do. 
They give me a ticket. Kind of brushed up against the ticket. She got ahead of me. She brought her papers out, showed them. He looked at her, looked at them, put her back in the pocket. I come up, took them out, laid them down. If he just said one word, I was done right there. And that's after we'd blown the bridge. So that was a uh, bad time to get caught. Anyway, never said nothing, folded up, put it in, and uh, went was, on a train trip. Was this a German or a... In French? France. Was a Frenchman who was checking the papers or a German? Huh? Was, who was checking the papers, a German soldier or a Frenchman? Uh, no, the French people made the papers. Okay. <coughs> but who, was, and, who checked them on the trains? Uh, who who inspected them on the trains? And, uh, German soldiers. Okay. See, they couldn't speak French, thank <laughs> God. <laughs> so uh, all he could do is see if it looked like you. Well, I took you back to when you'd been injured and recovered. Now I want to bring you back forward. Now, as you're working with them, are you going on missions before you blow that bridge? Had you done other missions yes. as well? Yes, we <clears throat> sniped some uh, cars. Uh, there was a road down in there that you'd see a couple of motorcycles, the sidecars ahead, and a couple of motorcycles behind, then a staff car. Well, you try to shoot the driver. You're shooting across about 400 yards across the valley. <clears throat> Well, for them to get to you, they had to come way down and then come right up a steep edge. So two or three of you would fire all at the same time, then you wouldn't move. Just lay there. It was in the undergrowth, and then you start backing out and then disappear. Uh, we um, all blew up some odds and ends of stuff, <coughs> and um, they had... Um, some things that went on I didn't like. Uh, did you ever see a French girl bald-headed as I am? <laughs> Boy, there ain't no sex appeal to them at all. <laughs> well, <clears throat> they would catch a, a, a French girl fraternizing with the Germans, and they'd shave her head and beat her up. Sometimes they'd even shoot them. Well, I couldn't go that route. That, uh, what the hell, she wasn't doing anything. He, getting a little food for her family or something like that. And <clears throat> that was kind of the least of my worries. Now, I did have a bad situation in Pamier, uh, I mean, uh, Edward, <coughs> brought this guy in to see me, and he had a way to get me out. <clears throat> Going to get you out. And he spoke good English. <clears throat> and he had to have my picture. Going to give me new papers. So he took my picture, and he'd be back in a few days. <clears throat> with uh, my new papers. Well, in the meantime, we found out he was a German collaborator. He wasn't trying to get me out. What he was doing, he was getting paid to get me where the Germans could get me. Kind of, if I could stay deep in the uh, FFI and Maki -E territory, I had pretty good protection. And uh, <clears throat> so he showed back up, and Edward told me, he said he's a collaborator. So he knocked on the door, and I was standing inside with the 45 automatic. I said, come in, as he opened the door, and wham, right straight in the face. That is how cheap life is. When you are in that situation, life is cheap, their life or your life. And when they're trying to com <coughs> complain about our Iraq soldiers that we have over there for shooting innocent civilians and stuff like that, that is wrong, because those people are collaborating, and your life is important. So I stay 100 percent. We never going to prosecute any American for shooting a civilian. <clears throat> but that's my personal opinion. And uh, it went on, and <clears throat> they finally invaded northern France, and then they invaded southern France, and and I made my way. Uh, <clears throat> back and come out down around Pugetani and uh, got taken prisoner by the Americans. <laughs> and uh, they well, asked me some questions about ball games, and I said, I don't know nothing about ball. Wait, I'm not going to let you just tell it that quickly. You could, how, did, how on earth were you taken prisoner by your own troops? Tell us how that happened. What's that? How on earth did your own people take you prisoner? What was the circumstances of that <laughs> event? Just like that. Well, I come in. How are you dressed? Or? Knickerbockers, black shirt, who did they gray think, on. Who did they think you were? And Lord knows, I was carrying a <laughs> schmeiser hanging down out from underneath oh. my coat. 
And um, now, did you know they were? Yeah, well, they were in American so, uniforms. They was. So and, you, uh, you basically came to them and said, "Here I am." Or yeah, they just um, uh, challenged me and uh, basically took me prisoner. And uh, <clears throat> I couldn't answer any baseball questions. To one of them said, "Hell, if he can cuss like that, he has to be an American." <laughs> and uh, so I uh, told them I extended the story, and they said, "Take off." If you've been back in there for three months, you sure ought to get along here all right. And uh, I, uh, uh, walking down the street, looking around, and you know what, boy, this is nice to be free. <laughs> I seen a Jeep go by, and they had uh, some officers in it. So I jumped in the Jeep, and I thought they were going to shoot me. It was uh, ATC, uh, Air Transport Command. Oh. <clears throat> and I told them who I was and thing, and oh my God, who took me out to their barracks, it was all officers. And I had to sleep in a major's bed, they were cop that night. And next day they got me on a flight to um, uh, Italy. And um, it, um, the whole thing is uh, just one episode after the next, after the next, after the next. Now, when during this period you just described, did people in your original outfit know you were alive, and when did your family learn? Nobody knew nothing. Uh, <clears throat> I got into uh, Naples, and uh, <clears throat> being an extreme hothead, <laughs> I couldn't fly into Barry. that's where I wanted to go into the headquarters, <clears throat> till the next day. So I said, well, I'll go down to Red Cross or whoever they may be, and send a telegram home to my wife. Well, I didn't have no money. She says, um, I said, well, I've been missing in action. I don't know you have. Where's your dog tags? Where's your pay book? I said, you don't have pay books and dog tags, and you're back in where I'm at. And one thing led to another, and I guess I got pretty <clears throat> hostile. And I heard some woman behind me turn around, and it was a captain. It was a nurse. And she said, what's your problem? And I said, I just spent three months behind enemy lines, and these dirty <laughs> won't let them send a telegram for me. <laughs> she said, send a telegram. I pay for it. <laughs> so I sent my wife a telegram. Now, the telegram, you coded. <clears throat> you could have a big, you know, read down and said, number 16, um, happy birthday, number 32, love and kisses. And so I picked out four or five, and... <clears throat> I got a copy of it in my book, and uh, my wife got it and on her birthday. She's oh. working at State Farm, Bloomington, <clears throat> and I come to my folks' house, and they called her and said, we got a telegram, and uh, it's for you, and uh, we think it's from Obi. She said, well, open it, open it. <laughs> so they said, uh, birthday greens, love and kisses, all well, <clears throat> and uh, oh, she just went spastic. Well, <laughs> that lasts on a couple of days, and they got a hold of the other mothers, you know, and nobody heard anything. Well, then they took the assumption that um, I put it in before I got shot down to send my wife a birthday greeting. And they got that. Well, then some of the other mothers, a couple of days later, they began to get some telegrams. It was three weeks before the government notified them that I had returned to active duty. <clears throat> and then I... Um, and long interrogation with the Air Force and stuff I'd seen, photographs I still had, and uh, um, so I ate good, I had a good time. The nurses, they got me, <coughs> it was kind of funny. This one, she was a, she had a big gal, she was a captain, and she said, where are you going to stay tonight? I said, I don't know. I said, I'll sleep in an alley somewhere, I'm least safe. She said, oh, no, you're not. She said, we're going to take you to the hotel. <clears throat> I said, oh, my God, here I am with four nurses, and they're taking me to the hotel. <laughs> and uh, good humor. So she uh, went down to the Air Transit Hotel. I went to get out. She said, no, you stay here in the car. So she made me stay in the car. She knew I'd cause trouble. And she came back. She said, got you fixed up. Got your room. So I went in there and went up the room, and they said, now, we're going out to the base, and we're going to get you some clean clothes and underwear, and we're going to bring you back food. 
man, you talk about a party, you never seen one. <laughs> but then the next day I had to move on, went down to um, Barry, Italy and interrogated and, and for about uh, a week and then come back to my base. And then I come home on um, a transport. It was a um, uh, James Parker built in 1937, something like that. <clears throat> and um, come into the United States and got interrogated. And, and uh, I will say one thing, and it's always stuck with my mind, it hurts a lot on another phase. Uh, I got um, clean uniform and got my stripes on, and they made sure I had my ribbons, my purple heart, the air medal, and everything except the good conduct ribbon. I didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I always wanted to see Hackensack, New Jersey. I was up to Camp Shanks. So I hitchhiked up. My God, you couldn't buy a drink. <clears throat> uh, people couldn't do enough for you, and I got on a great big party up there. And uh, this gal, uh, she says, you'll like my, uh, my son. And uh, he was a colonel. He was uh, with the first fighter group. And he had escorted us many times down there. Oh. <clears throat> so we had a big, big time, and they made sure I got back to Camp Shanks. And uh, one of the early things I'd done, I went in, and I wanted <clears throat> five dollars worth of change, nickels, dimes, quarters. All the money over there is paper money, funny money. <clears throat> And I always wanted again to put my hand down there and run it through a bunch of change and play with your change in your pocket. <clears throat> so um, I got a quart of milk and I was sitting on the street corner, uh, not on the corner, sitting right in the curb, feet in the street, drinking that milk. And people were just beautiful. But that would hurt me. These boys come back out of Vietnam and I had a son that had done two tours of duty in Vietnam with the 133rd CB Battalion. And what did they do with them? They threw rocks at them. Hmm. The damn draft dodgers was treated like heroes, and uh, the GIs were treated like dogs. Well, it didn't happen in World War II. We were treated with extreme high honor. So then I came home and <coughs> didn't do much. Just I was a flight engineer on a <coughs> modified B-25 for uh, a general. And I um, was out in Sioux City, Iowa, and Wichita Falls, Texas, and I had a good time. But that's about the end. It was a wonderful life. It's a wonderful so life. That was, that was what they had you doing until you were... Huh? That was, that was what you were doing as a member of the service until you were mustered out in September. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Just, I couldn't be sent to a combat area. I wanted to volunteer. <laughs> Let's go back. No. You cannot go back to your, I said, okay, I want to go to the South Pacific. That's where I wanted to go in the first place. No, you can't. Your class is a spy. And cool. any time that I got captured, I would be shot. <coughs> and um, so um, I was kind of like an unwed mother, if you want the <laughs> truth of it, that uh, nobody really particularly wanted to uh, get too close to me. <laughs> and um, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. Well, I'd, I'd like to see if there are any other stories you'd like to tell about the time you were with the Maquis behind lines. I interrupted you from telling the time where you met up with another member of your crew and then you made the decision not to wait around. Do you want to tell that story? Well, that story ended. I went <clears throat> and headed back down towards southern France. He got taken prisoner <clears throat> the next day or the next morning early and uh, he got sold out for a loaf of bread. <clears throat> and uh, uh, he spent uh, a couple of years in a prisoner war camp. He was on that death march, you know, where he marched him from, oh, I don't know, clear crossed up into Germany. <clears throat> and Benny's still alive. He's down in uh, uh, Memphis, Tennessee. In fact, I'm going to stop by and see him <clears throat> at the end of the month, visit with him a little bit. Now, how many of the, so that's, the, that's another member of your crew. So the other eight people, Dead. How many of them survived the war? They come out of the war. They did. Were, how many uh, were prisoners? But they all died off early. Yeah. How many were prisoners of war then? Uh, four. And uh, some of them laid, just laid back and, and uh, done nothing, done nothing. They got in different localities, and, but... Uh, but they were protected by the, the local by people? By the different local people. And... Uh, 
now, how typical was your experience as a crew compared to other crews that had been shot down? Were, were you the exception, or were there other cases like that? No. <clears throat> they depend on where you went down at. Um, uh, <clears throat> going down over Yugoslavia, you get shot down. <clears throat> going up to the target, you would allowed to beat the other crew back home. <laughs> they had a wonderful... Uh, Hell, Americans will fly in, land there, pick you up, and bring you back home. <clears throat> but um, any time you got shot down, it wasn't good, I can tell you that. It was not good. And uh, uh, some of them uh, just drifted off into the sunset, maybe you'd say. that um, uh, Really, there was not too many. Uh, our organization <coughs> that um, why don't I'm you explain to, the two pins you have on your lapel and what those what those organizations are what's that why don't you explain what the two lapel pins you're wearing represent the organizations well the top one there right there is, is the uh, order of the caterpillar uh, there's not too many of them out you have to jump from a <coughs> airplane on a emergency. <coughs> the red tail on the caterpillar supposedly indicates your plane was on fire. Mm. Now, <coughs> Eddie Doolittle's got it, uh, uh, President Bush, not <coughs> <coughs> President Bush's father has got the caterpillar. There's a lot of them out. Then the other one here is the silver boot. And the silver boot is the uh, Air Force uh, Scapey Evade organization, society. <clears throat> to belong to it, you had to be shot down, spend over a month behind the enemy lines fighting with the underground, or escape from a prisoner of war camp. So the amount of <clears throat> airplane we lost, and we got very, very few people on them, very few. And um, uh, <clears throat> then we're going to vote if we're going to have the next convention. It's supposed to be uh, in Philadelphia, I believe, but we don't think we're going to have it. There's not enough of us left. Can I had my 19th birthday <coughs> in behind enemy lines, mm. and uh, I'll be 40, uh, 40 hell. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be 85 uh, the um, 7th of August. So you couldn't have been there much younger than I was. And uh, <clears throat> so they've dwindled off. They've dwindled off real bad. Now, we had some old men on part of the cruise. We had one guy on our crew, and he was 31 years old. <laughs> he was granddaddy. <laughs> and uh, it, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Now, I had uh, one brother was uh, with the Patton's Armored Division. And down in North Africa and then up into France, and they shipped him home in a body cast from his <coughs> toes to the, his armpits. He did live. He died a couple years ago. I had another brother that flew L-4s for the 110th Field Artillery, and uh, he um, uh, had a very, very rough time of it. But we all lived through it. We all have something to be proud of. They're all dead. I'm the only one alive. <clears throat> so we're getting dwindled out. And then what few got out. Now, out of our bomb group, <coughs> we had 55 <coughs> crews, original crews. Out of 55 crews, one person got in all his missions. He was shot down on his uh, last mission and uh, blown out of the side of the airplane. He had a parachute on. He was a waste gunner. <clears throat> the airplane was blown in half. He went out. <clears throat> he was taking PW. But the loss was tremendous, tremendous. We, I'd uh, been up to the <coughs> a lot of strange places. Um, one of them we used to call it the sausage factory. <clears throat> Where are you guys going? We're going up the sausage factory. Well, the sausage factor was Wununustad, Austria. And uh, so they'd pull the curtain back, and uh, you'd see it was up to the 
sausage factory, and you could hear everybody in the outfit says, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and you can blip that one out. <laughs> but that was the saying that went on. And I was up to, um, uh, <clears throat> oh, um, Palesti a couple times. Um, uh, up in the northern Italy, bad. There were some bad places up in there. <clears throat> and up to Bucharest and Budapest. And um, just a good average mission. And you talk about <clears throat> um, other people. Well, I had a good friend, <clears throat> Jerry Smith. And he was as good a bull crapper as I am, I think, or a little better. And he was shot down up in uh, <clears throat> um, Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he went back over there years later, and when they all jumped, they got hit, hit bad. They jumped it. He told them to bail out. And uh, the airplane lit in a cemetery, just like that, skidded down through the cemetery, nobody in it. Didn't hit a stone or anything. And he said he never could find out <clears throat> what happened to his nose gunner. Tried and tried and tried to find out what happened to his nose gunner. So uh, he asked some people there, and did anybody ever see his nose gunner? And, <clears throat> oh, come with us, come with us. And they took him down to about a four-story <clears throat> hotel, an inn. <clears throat> they had a hotel, bar, and stuff in it. And there was a picture on the wall. <clears throat> And it blew, when the aircraft blew up, it blew the nose turret out, the whole turret. Guns, everything went out, and he was in it. So he tumbled down from about 20,000 feet, <clears throat> went through the roof, went through the third floor and second floor, and as it come through the second floor, it busted open <clears throat> and threw him out, and then it went into the basement. He's got a picture of him. He's dead, of course, but he's hanging by his parachute like this off a broken timber right in front of the bar. And there's a big beer tapper there. And he says, the humorous part of this is his name was Brewer. <laughs> but there's millions of stories now. When I'm uh, starting down there on the 23rd in um, uh, Georgia to our convention, there'll be all kinds of reminiscing all getting together and drinking a little pop with foam on top and start reminiscing and uh, and you'll hear some wonderful stories and they're true they're true and uh, I so, uh, so these the missions from your bases sounded like they were a lot more risky than the ones that were flying out of Britain at the same time or <clears throat> flying out of where of Britain from well, the, from it the, was the same. Both of them were the same. Were they the same risk and everything? Because <clears throat> it was, it was absolutely no difference. <clears throat> Most of the outfits in uh, Italy were B-24s. Most of them out of uh, England were B-17s. There was some 24s, and <clears throat> the story is the same. If South Pacific or wherever it may be, the stories are the same. <clears throat> you got in the airplane. They told you where he was going. You went up there. If you made it back that night, you had a warm place to eat and sleep and some good food, the next day is going out again. And um, they had hard targets, we had hard targets. <clears throat> There's quite a rivalry between the 24s and the B-17s. And being a B-24 man, <clears throat> um, I call B-17s two Bs. What do you mean two Bs? Oh, they were to be here when we left and to be here when we got back. And um, they felt the same way about us, but it's all good, good friendly rivalry. And they both were good airplanes. We could carry a, a heavier bomb load. Uh, we could uh, fly faster. They could fly higher. And they could take more abuse. We could not take much abuse. And uh, when you... Um, uh, get hit in a 24, the wings have a tendency to break off. And um, another great tendency to get hit bad, lose engines, they start wallering like this. And then they'll drop and then they'll go on a flat spin. And that pins you up against the floor, up what you normally be a ceiling, pin you up in there and you can't get out. And uh, <clears throat> 
In fact, um, the 24 was known as a wallerby. <laughs> and that was the reason, because she'd flip on her back and she'd just waller around <laughs> coming down. But they done a lot, a lot of damage, and I'm going to tell you. And uh, uh, there'll never be another, uh, I don't know if you call it a wonderful war or what, but there'll never be another time like it. And in the dog face, he suffered tremendously. We didn't have all the stuff <clears throat> suffering that uh, we had um, uh, clean place to eat and sleep. Dog face, he didn't. He'd eat K rations, sleep in the rain, the snow, the mud, and still got shot. <clears throat> and um, um, war is no pleasant thing, but you can come out with a lot of respect. And I'm going to tell you one thing, and I've proved it. Don't ever touch that American flag if I'm around it. <laughs> now, you're going to have a fight, and I don't give a damn how many people are there. I'm going to tie into the middle of it. I can have one last fling of glory in my life. And if we don't all feel that that American flag is the greatest thing there is in the world, then we have no business being here. And uh, I hope that anybody sees this will give great <clears throat> honor not to me. Hell, I made it. Come on out. I'm alive. Made a good success of life after I come out. All these young lads that was in Korea, uh, Vietnam, <clears throat> and over there in Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, they um, need the encouragement and the great respect of the American people. And you can always stand up and salute them when they go by. Because they done their part. And we might, they talk about it, death toll in Iraq, 4,000. <clears> Over half of them was in an automobile accident, got drunk and fell out of the upstairs window or something. But there was a lot of them that was killed. There's a lot of them wounded. But how many men did we lose on VJ Day? I mean, VE Day, uh, the invasion, D Day. How many men did we lose? Thousands. How many did we lose in Anzio and Salerno? Thousands. So our war loss has been uh, minimal, and I um, I won't justify the Iraq, and I won't condemn it, either one. It was a job that um, our superiors um, decided should be done, and it was done. You take Schwarzkopf, um, you take Colin Powell, you've never heard them say one earthly word <clears throat> about an unjust war. You've never heard them say one word about their commanding chief because they were a real soldier and they'd done what they're supposed to do. And then it's just step back in civilian life. And uh, we have heroes, it's unbelievable. And I'm sure in hell not one of them. I might have the Purple Heart and the Air Medal four times, but uh, that don't mean anything. That was just that many more points to get out of the service on. Well, I, I would disagree with your comment. You're not a hero, but that'll be a discussion for another day. I want to thank you for giving us the story today. Are there any other points that you wanted to make before we um, end the, the interview? I don't believe so. I, I would say that uh, it was kind of a personal thing all the way through, and it was fun. Uh, when we were in Fresno, California, we had fun. When we was in Mountain Home, Idaho, we had fun. It's like when you've seen the picture of <coughs> everybody standing beside the airplane and, and with their parachutes on and the chaplain praying for a safe mission when he couldn't even get in the airplane with the damn parachute on. <laughs> and that was the... Uh, uh, impression they wanted to leave with mothers and stuff. And then you seen the picture of old Benny standing under the wing relieving himself and everybody throwing rocks at him. That is the true story that went on. So we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun and that just about caps it off. Well, thank you. Thank you for your service in World War II and thank you for being 
willing to come and tell us about it today. I appreciate that, and so do the rest of us. I appreciate getting the invitation, and I appreciate not for me, but for all the other servicemen from World War I right on through to the um, Iraq and there, that um, it's not one, it's all of us. And uh, uh, Patton had a, a little uh, saying, he said about the American always wanting to fight, and you know, and he says, well, what's going to happen when your uh, kids get grown up? And they said, what'd your daddy do in the war? He scooped horse shit down in Alabama. He said, uh, you want to be a combat man. And uh, Patton was a, a genius. Patton was a genius. <coughs> we had a lot of wonderful officers all the way through. And uh, it's just been a memorable time. It certainly has. Thank you, Obi. Thank you.